Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the episodes that I do. Uh, we're, we have a guest on today. You may or may not have seen them in uh, other episodes that I do. Julian Langer, famous um, eco-revoltist and, and um, phenomenologist and all sorts of other poetry. Uh, yeah, check him out. Um, and keep watching to check them out more. So, uh, I'm having Julian back on the show today because, uh, he's been reading some Albert Camus. I haven't done an episode on Albert Camus yet. Um, even though Camus was one of the main inspirations for my existentialism, uh, fascination. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, Julian, what's new? Um, Writing wise, not much, not much writing wise. Um, there's something, um, there's another short story in the lineup coming out, um, I think probably uh, on the winter solstice. Um, but I've not, I've not uh, had anything else published since we last chatted, I, uh, which was about Bretonite Rebellion. Um, but yeah, no, um, doing um, bits and bobs, went to, Anarchist Book Fair in Manchester, always fun going to those sorts of things. Lots and lots of people, lots of people who are going, work is freedom, work is freedom, organizing is freedom. And then a few of us who are like, no, nah, I don't know about that. Um, and uh, those sorts of things are entertaining. But, um, is, this the, is that the first book fair since COVID in a while or had there been other ones? No, I went to that book fair the year before. Um, and um, did I do any others in, in COVID? Um, no, I think the one I last one I'd done before that was before COVID. So yeah, been a while, been a little while. Um, no, but um, yeah, so not much to not much to report on, on that front. Yeah, typical book fair stuff, I guess, huh? <laughs> yes, I, I I like the thing of um, when you get to a book fair and if you're tabling, there's this whole thing that happens before people start arriving which is people who are like organizing it are like don't put them next to there don't put them next to that that one like you know keep them far away other side of the room these people cannot be like which is just like oh my god like these people are supposedly like you know all about like do what you want like you know freedom like it's it's okay to have different like lifestyles and perspectives and whatnot and and they can't be next to each other and 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 these are the people who have like very similar beliefs on the world, like very, very similar beliefs about things. But the minor differences are are so fucking dangerous that you can't sit near each other. So um yeah, it's it's an entertaining thing going to it going to an anarchist book fair as a tabler and just seeing that level of tension. Um and uh, yeah, and it's it's entertaining. <laughs> yeah the the book fair war zone <laughs> yes um <laughs> yes the um it's a it's an interesting thing the the level of hostility that, that happens in that space yeah yeah uh so um as far as camu goes you you uh what have you been reading lately um so I reread uh, the myth of Sisyphus, or Sisyphus, however you pronounce it, um, and uh, the Fool and Camus' um, piece, Create Dangerously, um, recently. Um, yeah, those are mostly because those were short ones. I, I wanted to kind of dip back into Camus. It's been a little while since I've read any Camus, and um, and yeah, so so I, I dipped into into those ones again. Um, like I think, obviously, anyone who kind of knows anything about Camus knows about the myth of Sisyphus, um, which I do think is a largely kind of misunderstood work um, on the face of it. Um, and then, like, The Fall is obviously kind of, it's his last novel, it's famous for that. And it, and it kind of, it's famous for being a kind of, that, 
modern representation of the fall of man from Eden and all that sort of things. And it's kind of, there's a very, um, it's a reason why it's kind of been one of his more popular novellas. Um, Great Dangerously, I think is really, uh, is one of his best pieces of um, writing though. I think actually it was a speech, it was written as a speech. Um, uh, but, it, but I think it's, it's really, it's a really valuable piece that he wrote, which is not, um, which is not included in conversation around Camus or just conversations around radical um, creativity, the value of art as a mode of kind of challenge and something that's, you know, something that's worth pursuing and doing. Um, so yeah, uh, I, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm very fond of Create Dangerously in particular. Of those. <laughs> So real quick before we get into those, um, as you, I'm sure you know, Albert Camus, from an anarchist perspective, it, he never claimed to be an anarchist, but he did publish in anarchist uh, journals, and he worked very closely with the anarcho-syndicalists in uh, France, and I think also some in Spain. Um, there's a book out in Spanish which unfortunately I don't read, called Escritos Libertarios, which is a collection of Camus' writings specifically touching on his libertarian socialist politics. And um, there's uh, an essay out on Libcom, or I got a copy on my site, called Camus, Albert, and the Anarchists, which goes over some of this history specifically if uh anybody wants to read into that since we're not necessarily going to be touching on it uh as as we talk um so yeah so he's important from that standpoint i've written a couple essays about him myself specifically on his book the rebel and also just uh trying to pull together some of the threads that make his thought more or less anarchist in its conclusions, particularly from that book. But anyway, um, moving on. So Myth of Sisyphus is, yeah, one of the more well-known ones. Besides, in America, a lot of people read The Stranger in high school, I think, or mm -hmm. um, whatever, introductory college courses. Did in uh, did Myth of Sisyphus come out first um, in the stuff you read chronologically? In my readings of Camus, yeah, yeah. So the Myth of Sisyphus was the um, uh, one of the first books on of philosophy I ever read, um, and yeah, it's the first thing by Camus I, re I read. Um, yeah, and I think it's uh, I think it's one of his absolute best pieces of writing um particularly um the the um thing where he um describes the the strangeness of the world as being the absurd and with that it's it's not just this um kind of thing about thought and reasoning and kind of the limits of reasoning but it's actually about this encounter of being in the world um and this 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 quality which is um you know akin to what Sartre was describing in nausea um or kind of portraying in nausea which is is this thing of like fuck this is all really weird and strange and like when you stop kind of taking it on this kind of like habitual basis this kind of like normative habit of this is what normal life is actually this is really fucking weird like before this i was like like before we started this conversation i was in a metal box being fueled by like black stuff that was which is dead stuff from like millions of millions of fucking years ago which is contributing to global warming and is part of mass extinction and it's fucking bizarre that all this and now now i'm here like talking to you this is like fucking what it, it's it's just it's it's strange it's peculiar all, all these things and yeah and i and i um i find that quality of the um 
the text really, really beautiful. Yeah, and for, and for anyone who hasn't read it, I mean, the way the text is written is it's a meditation on suicide. And, right, the, yes. Yes. the, the book opens up, or the essay begins with something, the line is like, something about if there's one important philosophical question, it's the question of suicide. So it's not the first sentence of the, of the essay, because there's uh, two paragraphs first, but in the, in the section, the first proper section, um, absurdity and suicide, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. That's the... Uh... Right. Yeah. So, yeah, the tone is really set in a... <laughs> uh, in a pretty severe light and um but for me and this is this is this is what i think is kind of often this is my interpretation totally my interpretation um for me when i encounter it i don't encounter it as a book about whether or not to commit suicide or an essay on whether or not to commit suicide um for me, I encounter it um, as kind of what Camus doing with that sentence, that 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 thing of questioning suicide, is positioning that the complete it's the complete opposite kind of sort of question. What's 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 considered through the book, which is whether or not to embrace life or renounce life, and so it's. It's not a question about, oh, should I commit suicide? It's questioning like the reason behind affirming life. And there's a there's something, as much as it's a dark way to affirm to to approach this consideration of affirming life, it's ultimately a work of life affirmation for me, if that makes makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Um and so you know, I'm sure most people are familiar with the actual myth of Sisyphus, but if you want to briefly explain what that is, since it it's such a important part of the book. Well, it's part of the kind of concluding section of the uh, book before the appendices, um, which uh, it draws from the, the, it's basically putting forward the, the Greek myth, um, which is... Um, Sisyphus, um, for a bunch of reasons which I can't remember off the top of my head, pisses off the gods and his punishment, which um, Camus likens to the human um, condition, uh, is that every day he pushes up this um, gigantic boulder, this big rock, up a hill or a mountain, and then at the end of the day, tumbles back down. And he has to go that back down, and then the next day he does the same thing, and it's absurd because every because he knows it's going to fall back down, but he does it anyway. And it's the thing, you know, every birth we are born and and we try and rise up these mountains, we try and overcome these things, and then eventually we fall down the mountain and we die. And like that's one way of reading that. Um, I think there's an environmental way of reading that, which is like um, humanity. Is it's it's almost like a kind of collapsist type uh, just kind of picture, right? Humanity is trying to uh, trying to push a rock up and defy, uh, you know, push against the, the gravitational pull to Earth through kind of you know we're we're extracting these these things out of the soil. We're going to push it up, up, push it up, push it up, push it up, and then it all collapses back down to, to Earth in that kind of pessimistic the uh, the unhuman. The human always collapses into the unhuman, like and yeah, and and that's kind of a something I, I think is a is a possible take from that from that imagery. Um, but yeah, that's a the myth of Sisyphus. Yeah, and and so so like the one of the main ways that it plays into the text is Camus. Uh, he poses this problem where because the universe is inherently meaningless, and human beings uh, have the choice to kill themselves. Uh, they're, that human beings need to find uh, a way to value life themselves, even though um, the universe doesn't provide any of that meaning for them. And this is sort of his 
uh, way of describing that problem as the myth of Sisyphus, because to get that value, you kind of need to keep trying to create it on a daily basis is sort of the way I think about it. And then he moves through different, different um, levels or uh, types of suicide, philosophical suicide or metaphysical suicide or what have you. Do you want to like give a little bit of a discussion of some of those different problems that he, he brings up? Yeah, I can do like, what way do you want to start? Uh, I, you have the book right there, right? I don't remember in what order he presents the problems, but I know the chapters are broken down uh, or the sections are, are in order of those problems. Like, well, so there's in the section, like, yeah, the absurd man, he looks through like individuals like Don Juan and um, these other kind of literary figures and Hamlet and plays it out with that. Um, I think there's a, um, perhaps a, for anyone watching this and listening, it's probably a more enjoyable way to do that because rather than doing the kind of hoity-toity literary thing, like there's, it's much, what I find more interesting is this consideration of um, the the leap of faith and his rejection of the leap of faith in that kind of what he describes as philosophical suicide or metaphysical suicide. Um, and, um, and with that, he considers uh, Kierkegaard's philosophy of the absurd and Shezdov's philosophy of the absurd, um, which um, are two quite different but similar kind of responses to the absurd. Um, and they're two probably of Camus' biggest influences. Um, uh, my understanding is Kierkegaard was the first um, philosopher he ever read. Um, and uh, But he gives more kind of attention um, to Shezdov, even though Shezdov's position is a lot closer to Camus. Um, and um, yeah, so in, in seeking to challenge the response to the absurd of the of the leap of faith we're just going to have a leap of faith that while we cannot find an inherent meaning in the universe just trust in in god or scripture or whatever um camus rejects that on the basis of that being um a kind of trying to um like negate the absurd or kind of like uh over overstep overstep it <laughs> which i think in I think in Kierkegaard's um, case is a fair critique. I don't think he gives um, Shezdov a fair kind of reading because Shezdov's not doing the same thing as Kierkegaard, though it looks the same. Kierkegaard does kind of, there is this thing of the absurd, but do the leap of faith. I'm going to do, well, he doesn't say you should do the leap of faith. He says, I'm going to do the leap of faith thing and just believe in God because I, I need that meaning, which is, a response which Camus considers philosophical suicide. Shezdov, um, Shezdov's God is not the same as like Kierkegaard's God or kind of the God of uh, classical theism. Shezdov's God in my readings of Shezdov is the absurd in itself, is the, um, is having, and his faith, his, his, um, his uh, belief in, in God is, is, is having faith in the kind of, irrational cosmic indifference that in some something in that we we that we can live in that so it, it's much closer to um to Camus because it's not kind of seeking to negate it or transcend it. it it's much more about being with it though there is a kind of deification thing going on there which um shares which um Camus kind of treats as um in a kind of he uses the word, calls it mystical in, in a way where he's, he's meaning religious. Um, he's not talking about the mysticism of kind of what, um, like a mystical anarchist sort of practice or, you know. Um, and um, and I think that there's something um, within that that's particularly uh, beautiful about both Shezdov's and Camus' perspectives because um, 
like Camus as, as a French Nietzschean, um, there's a quality in a lot of his write, writings of that kind of a Nietzschean paganism, the heroism that that, that goes on with that, and um, and Shestov's, uh conception of God, as I've read Shestov and as I've encountered this, is just my interpretation with it being kind of this, um, rather than this being kind of this uh, father-like figure um, or this kind of guiding hand figure. Um, has, it has a much more kind of pagan quality of kind of being this quite unkind and nasty um, kind of over not overlord but you know what I mean like um, and which is uh, yeah it's it's not the Shestov was it was a, a a Jewish philosopher even though he, was, he liked Jesus quite a bit um, but um, yeah there's something in that kind of in the difference between the leap of faith and the faith in the absurd, which I find a really interesting difference personally in terms of responses to philosophical suicide um, or actual embodied suicide, um, having faith in that kind of irrational will to life or will to power, whatever you want to call it, or the absurd. Um, yeah, that just interests me and I find quite beautiful. So, uh, so just to clarify, when Camus talks about the absurd, what what is exactly is he saying? So, there's a few things, a, a few different things, and they are different but related and connected. Um, the first one, that for me, the first and most important one is the strangeness of the world. World that kind of weird quality um, which kind of comes from the second one of that kind of cosmic unreasonableness, kind of that, that, that universal, like what, what's the reason for anything? Why is anything here? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why are we born? Um, and that kind of, that inability um, even through kind of causal reasoning and whatnot to, to find, because ultimately when you do causal reasoning, you, arrive at the uncaused causer which is a pretty um unreasonable position to get to um so um yeah there's um those two and i i think the there's also a, a thing with with the absurd there's this kind of very lived experience thing because those those two are one's kind of ecological one's kind of epistemological and then there's this kind of existential quality of um every living being who is born um, is born to a condition where they are going to die. And there is something about that, which is, um, which is just kind of absurd, and weird, and kind of just makes you go, why? Um, and everything that they do throughout their, their life, it doesn't matter in the sense of, it might matter in that moment and that's a really beautiful thing. And, I, and that's something that personally in my writing, I want to affirm that in every single moment, it fucking is beautiful and matters. Um, but in this kind of cosmic and kind of outside of the present moment sort of sense in that kind of being towards death sense, being in time, Heidegger, as we've kind of spoken about before, there is this kind of thing of where we, you know, um, what's the line from fight club on a long enough timeline, the survival rate for everyone is zero, right? That's just, you know, and it's kind of, it's, and it's an absurd ex encounter. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and then, so now that we have like an understanding of what he means by the absurd, what, what is his solution or what does he try to propose is the, the way that, human beings should deal with that situation um i certainly don't think he he presents a solution or a way that human beings should do so i'm, I'm gonna really like just pin on that I, I i certainly don't the idea that he's he even claims that there's a solution i think um would be a really would be doing him a disservice um and and i don't encounter him as a, a um a very normative 
philosopher. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm going to just just do that. His response, which um, I think it's fair to say is his, uh, which I find beautiful, and I kind of and I kind of meet with a thing of similarity and wanting to draw from. It's why I've been very inspired by Camus throughout my life. Um, is this idea of revolt or rebellion or being the rebel, um, which is this, um, which again, it, it's it's it in a similar way to his kind of um, like pagan esque qualities is very um, Nietzschean in that it is this kind of absurd, mad, like unreasonable yes saying to life is this thing of um, I'm gonna. I'm going to live as fully and as passionately, as creatively as as I can, um, as I as I'm able to do so. As so, you know, so much so that my my very existence is is rebellion. You know, I, I rebel, therefore I am, um, and um, that's um, you know that's in both the Mephistopheles and and the Rebel. Um, and there's something in that which is um which is not just um found in his his thought it's kind of it, it's that sort of idea of being alive or living in itself being a mode of a form of rebellion or revolt um is something that i i think is um it's not just limited to, to Camus, that kind of response. Um, yeah, it's a very beautiful response, in my in my opinion. Yeah, and for if you haven't read this, it's like, what, like 80 pages long? It's not a very long text. So Let me just see if it's not. This, this is a copy that I've got. Um, 131 pages, including the appendices. Okay, I was off by 100, but close. <laughs> close <enough. laughs> Uh, so you said you read a couple other texts, neither of which I've read. So, uh, you're going to have to do a lot of explaining. Um, okay. Which one well, do you want to um, talk about first? Well, before we go on to the other ones I've been reading recently, I think there's a, there's a couple others, which I think would be better for getting a basis of kind of Camus thought. Sure. So, um, I think we, cause we spoke about like the, re the rebel a little bit. And I think the rebel is a really, um, particularly, um, because it is his like political text is his like most kind of if you want to get Camus politics or anti politics um the rebels like a really good place to go with it and um like how um if we consider the Mephistopheles as considering the question of whether or not uh to die the rebels simply whether or not to kill um, and again, it's it's a it's a very life affirming uh, work of writing. Um, it's a very uh, challenging um, work of writing, and particularly how it challenges um, uh, Hegelian uh, kind of type practice, the the idea of the dialectic. Um, and um, there's a beautiful line in it, which I'm going to not do justice to. I'm going to paraphrase. Which is um, where he's he's kind of critiquing uh, Marxist politics and like brings Hegel in into the, the critique and um, and affirms Hegelian philosophy and kind of the following kind of stuff that draws from Hegelian philosophy as being indifferent to the life of the individual um, and um, and there's this whole thing there's another section where he um, with that kind of uh in in hegel what he's critiquing and in marxism what he's critiquing is this kind of this pro this practice of negation this practice of annihilation and and like and the kind of the the, the political machinery and narratives of that process which is kind of inherent to totalitarian type practices um but he doesn't what, and what I like about this is he doesn't just stop in that critique with the kind of with the Marxists and the Nazis and those kind of you know those more obvious and kind of ones where we we, we just know that's fucking shit. Um, he also he critiques the kind of nihilist anarchist 
um, thing of the just negativity, the just negation thing in a way where I think is really needed in like um, in like this in our kind of conversations in anarchist discourse um, where I think that there's he doesn't do the thing in the in that absurdism is a kind of mode of nihilistic thought or kind of it's a it's a nihilism which rather than going like everything's meaningless just negate does the everything's meaningless positively affirm and there is a there is a kind of a positivist kind of doing positivism as kind of an absurd positivism rather than like logical positivism and all that there is a positivist kind of uh political kind of agenda within the rebel which i think is beautifully done in create dangerously which is um in, in this kind of this thing of how, how how does he want to rebel and how does he encourage others to rebel through through this thing of create dangerously through absolute creativity as being a positive kind of not not in like a a good thing but it being it's not negation you know it can be destructive positivity and you know in that art is destructive you you destroy the materials that you're using to create something and there's something yes it, it might be absurd and it might not do anything in the terms of like political narratives doing something um you know because this is you know the in the myth of Sisyphus there is this thing of like um we are not doing future building because there is there you know that we there is no future we we all die it's all absurd right but there is this thing of I'm still going to affirm life I'm still going to affirm creation in the here and now I'm still going to do that with mad passion and that's what he advocates in uh create dangerously in a really beautiful way um and i think that's that kind of that challenge to the ideologies of of negativity um through this kind of creative um you know it's creative drive which uh is very rem reminiscent of a kind of nietzschean will to power like nietzsche's affirmation of art and music and all that as part of yes saying to life um and that kind of heroic individualism um or as Camus would put it the rebel or the revolt <laughs> um you know or as i put it eco revolt um but like you know just to plug me there um yeah, yeah that's yeah. um that's that's a that's something which i i feel is um one of the most important aspects of kind of Camus' kind of more political projects and um and i think one of the most beautiful aspects of him as a as a kind of um political figure so one of the really in, so there's a, a lot to say about the rebel first mm -hmm. of all uh from an anarchist perspective you know bakunin makes his way into the book uh sterner makes his way into the book he uh camu actually does spend time engaging with with these figures who are popular anarchist uh, influencers or what have you. Um, <laughs> influencers. Uh, well, I say that about Sterner because it's debatable whether or not he is an anarchist, but um, definitely had an influence. Uh, you know, and Nietzsche is critiqued. Uh, the book begins, it's grouped into like metaphysical rebellion, political rebellion, he really goes, he tries to write a broad history of rebellion generally. So he talks about dandyism, romanticism, uh, Nacheyev, I think, is critiqued in there, nihilism, like political nihilism, uh, the Nazis, like you said, Stalin, everything. And this book actually is what led to the split between him and Sartre mm. because um, Sartre had someone write a review of it that was really scathing for his magazine, Le Temps Modern, Modern Times. And uh, Camus got really pissed about it. <laughs> and um, uh, so that's one part of it. it. There really is, like, it's not just, you don't have to make inferences. The, mm. the actual engagement with anarchist thought is in the text yeah. in that way. But it's also there in another really interesting way, which is in the conclusion to the book where Albert Camus 
is writing about uh, moderation and it's the section called thoughts at the meridian and what's fascinating about this is the only uh like totally approving example in the whole book of rebels throughout history that camus uh uses as an example is syndicalist trade unionists in other words anarchists he basically at the end of the book concludes that the way to rebel is this way through this uh of affirmation of the dignity of the worker through syndicalist organizing and um basically through anarchist syndicalism so yeah i've always been really frustrated by the lack of engagement anarchists seem to have with this text and it spent some time dealing with that um <laughs> But yeah, it's uh, it it is the follow up to the myth of Sisyphus, and those two texts together, uh, really present a whole uh, philosophy. I feel like the, there is a, a there is a there is a, a broad philosophy there, um, um, and it's somewhat holistic. I don't I don't I don't know if I could say there's ever a whole philosophy, but um, but you know, um, I don't, and I think. In terms of his um, his perhaps fetishization of anarcho syndicalism and anarcho syndicalist kind of politics, there's um, something to be said if I you know for the context um, of that, and um, because I often I do feel like there is. Um, just going back to that that thing of the absurd is the strangest of the world is the absurd. There is something that is um, spatial and environmental, and in that way, kind of ecological about Camus' thought. In that in that way, that just the world is um, is is a space. It's it, and it's an environment, and um, and with that, you know. Yeah, he has this one kind of thing that he's he's loving at, at the point of writing this, which I forget when this was originally published. Um, published. This is where my dyslexic ability to draw out words is going to fuck me up. First published nineteen fifty one um, in France. Nineteen fifty one in France. Well, we're talking um, kind of pre-situationist stuff we're talking um before kind of environmentalism is a real political movement outside of the you know we've got the french kind of anarcho nature stuff and the spanish anarcho nature stuff but that's not really a big thing um in america you've got some stuff in the terms of the conservationist kind of projects going on but it's it, you've not got that kind of that, that those discourses going on, um, which we've kind of got now, which fit a kind of contemporary eco-anarchist conversation, like you know, post-situationist, whether that's primitivist or what, um, like that are kind of very um, spatially embedded rather than productive narrative embedded. So I I think there's something about context there, um, uh, but um, yeah. It's, I it, it the the kind of the thing where he where he is like you know very um, I like those syndicalist guys. It, it's not the part of the text that, that gets me the most, but I kind of go like, yeah, you were you were a guy writing a thing at a time when you know. So, so yeah, so let let me provide a little more context too, because what he's doing there is he's looking for an example of this idea of moderation. Um, when it comes and in, in the text, what that means is somewhere between absolute affirmation and absolute negation. He's looking for this. So first of all, he's against revolution. He's against yeah. this idea of, uh, anyone seizing state power and imposing an order yeah, on totally. society, but he is for insurrection. 
And the reason, the reasoning behind it is this idea of moderation where you need uh, to, to not fall into this trap of hurting other people, killing other people. It has to come from an affirmation of the principle of rebellion um, without going all the way into absolute negation. And so he's saying that the syndicalists are in affirming their own dignity uh, and not going all the way to the point of uh, mass murder <laughs> to yeah. impose a system. They're representative of a praxis that that um, that walks that fine line. So it's not so. He uses them as an example, but you know, you could use other examples that would be more from, you know, the heroes of uh, primitivism or other schools of anarchist thought in in that place for sure. Yeah, totally, totally. Um, no, thank you for doing that. You did that description of moderation kind of better than I than I, I could have done. So that, that was that was well put. Um, I am. Um, that's a part of the the book. Um, where he's particularly where he is like doing that challenge to the idea of a uh, revolution where I, I always wonder um, how much of an influence was the like of Amand um, or those kind of those other kind of revolution challenging anarchists who are kind of who, who are putting forth those sorts of um, yeah like you know anti-revolutionary thought which is something that I've um, I've always, I particularly Iman's critiques of revolution. I've, I've found um, uh, beautiful. Um, but yeah, um, I, yeah. I, well, Sterner makes a makes a critique of revolution as well yeah, uh, in a similar way. So yeah, but I I find I find Sterner's. I, I'm I'm less fond of of Sterner in. Um, than I am of Armand and Camus, and so I I, I don't go to, to Sterner as, as as a point of reference as much. Yeah, um, same. <laughs> I mean, I'm not familiar with Armand, but I'm not no? super fond of Sterner. <laughs> I, I think Sterner has um, has some value and some place, um, which is which is you know, obviously has a place because he's there. But like, there's there there is there's something of that where he is in in the discourse which i can kind of affirm but i do yeah i do um feel it's you know he's deified to a point where i just kind of go no I, i'm not quite i'm not quite on on that um on with that but yeah yeah one of the reasons uh i became so fascinated with existentialism generally is because you find critiques of sterner in there that you don't find other places. And in Camus, I'm mm. not sure if Sartre deals with them. I don't remember. I think he does. But in one person who does, which is really out there, and most people haven't heard of him, is this uh, psychologist, um, Ludwig Binswanger. And he's got this untranslated text. It's still in German. Uh, called uh the the foundations or whatever of being human being together i don't know off the i've been working on translating it but there's a whole chapter on sterner and critiquing his his was position that on, was that on the human did you say on the human being on human beings being the other no let me let me look real quick it's like uh the ground forms and knowledge of human something, something. <laughs> um, sorry, audience, you're going to have to wait. <laughs> I can just flap my hands so something's going on. Just flap yeah. my hands. Just look at the hands. Look at the hands, audience. <laughs> So the German title is Grundformen und Erkenntnis, Erkenntnis Menschlichen Daseins. And that I think roughly translates to the, the groundwork and knowledge 
of human existence. Uh-huh. But the the actual content of the book is all about being together, being hyphenated togetherness. And it's really a book about love and like a like a alternate ontology of uh the midzine to mm-hmm. Heidegger and Sartre and uh, a lot of the other writers in the existential phenomenology. I don't know. Anyway, not to get too carried away. Uh, <laughs> there's a whole chapter on Stirner, and he critiques Stirner's uh, attempt to for the for the ego to become its own foundation, which is a really interesting angle. But, okay. Um, yeah, Camus. <laughs> Camus. 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 Um, yeah. So um, what? It sounds like the next place to go then would be the the create the one on creativity. What is it called? Create dangerously. Well, it's a very short text. Um, like it's it's a very very. Sh- I, I believe it was. Uh, it's it's a speech of his, if I remember correctly. I'm just gonna like. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a speech delivered at the University of, um, I'm not going to say that right, um, up, up south, Uppsala in Sweden in December um, 1957. Um, and um, yeah, it's largely a an appeal to um, to dangerous creativity um which is all creativity in the context of um kind of post-nazi cold war like you know europe um and and with that not just for kind of um not for a kind of careful creativity because it's dangerous to create now but a madly passionate kind of all it as something where it's the act of doing it passionately and kind of kind of with that mad kind of drive um being a part of the rebellion rather than rather than trying to you know doing it as safely as possible to avoid being seen or you know avoid um avoid the dangers but to do it in a way which is um which engages with that um with that experience of danger um which i think is uh it's a brave thing to put forward it's certainly something which um i know there's a kind of there's there's an avoidance of of dangerous activity um in kind of a lot of um kind of security culture and safe space stuff which um which i get i understand and i can i can appreciate why it's there i can appreciate why people do the security culture thing it's like if you're doing underground like activities um but i think there is something really uh worth affirming in the kind of the in the dangerous thing where you, where you're not um well, you're not fearful of of what might happen from your creativity where you where you where you brave the act of creating something that is possibly going to um to trigger a response that might be hostile towards you which might not be favorable towards you um and having that be part of the rebellion that kind of that that kind of uh the bravery and courage it takes to do that again it's a it's a somewhat nietzschean type image of rebellion kind of that kind of heroic individualism indifference to the uh to the rejection from the herd or whatever but you know what i mean there's there's um something in that which is uh which i i think is is very risky obviously in that it's, it's dangerous it's dangerous and risk is goes hand in hand um and and it is uncomfortable for many who who don't want to don't want to get any shit thrown at them for 
for doing rebellious activities, rebellious, creative, artistic, not even artistic, but any rebellious activity. Like most of the people I know who are involved in like hunt sap stuff, like don't, which is just another dangerous activity. They, they hide their identities as much what as is possible. It involved in what stuff? Hunt sap. So badger. Oh yeah. And yeah, yeah. Stuff. yeah. Okay. So like, you know, most of the kind of anarchists and activists I know, like, will for the most part avoid their their names and faces being like associated with anything and because of like fear of you know the being you know what it might do to their their work prospects or you know the fear of being on some list somewhere in a office of naughty people like these are the, the this is the naughty people list. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. And 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 I get that. And um, and I and I, and I say that knowing that I'm I'm talking to you with your uh your 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 public thing being the 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 cyber right. dandy rather right. than rather than your actual kind of the name you you go by day to day, which you know I'm obviously not going to say because but I I there's something that I find really beautiful in the kind of the the, the dangerous act of like of just not caring about the safety measures Does that makes sense sounds, sounds pretty punk rock uh, <laughs> <laughs> what what is what is like the flavor of this this text i've never i've never read it i've never heard of it even so um, i'm not familiar with it at all so there's just trying to find a good bit to read, but I'm not good at. This is one of the things where, I've, if I've not highlighted something, like to find like a quote, being dyslexic, I just go yeah words. I need to do it in the right order. Which is not good <laughs> for quickly trying to find something, um, yeah. just to to read. Um, so it's. It's not a kind of, it's not an analysis, and it's not theory. It's an it's an appeal. It is an it's a it's a it's it's like a communicate. He's communicating something. And he's communicating this kind of this this value in um, in rebellious art and in art that um, creativity that involves some degree of risk to the creator something that's challenging and affirms life and freedom and like you know and kind of rejects the kind of the the politics of negation whether that's stalinism or nazism or all the others that he did in the red bull in much more detail um and he you know he references um some of the names i just noticed in there when i was just looking through was like oscar wilde who has been was one of my first kind of heroes um uh and like uh rimboard i've never i'm not sure if i pronounced that right arthur rimboard um, rimbo rimbo um and um and like you know and it's that kind of those individuals or and individualists because there is something in this kind of while he's not um entirely an individualist but this kind of that will segue onto the um the outsider, the stranger, that kind of quite nicely in terms of flowing into Camus stuff. There is a something of there is something of a kind of individualist kind of uh, praxis in this piece of kind of create danger through affirming like Wild as Wild's kind of you know he's one of the great individualists and kind of and art is largely I know there are kind of in particularly in activist circles kind of collective art stuff which always feel very manufactured to me. Um, don't, don't feel kind of like madly passionate. They feel very designed and very like most of the ones that I've encountered in my life. But there, there's something right. of a kind of uh, individualist, uh, anarchist kind of uh, flavor to, to that kind of, to what he put forward in this speech, um, which I, I find... Um, very uh, attractive again it fits a kind of nietzschean type praxis um but i don't but with it being affirmed as dangerously like which i think 
like if you take um the stranger the outsider whichever way you translate it which is kind of one of his most um intense kind of uh thought experiments on individuality and the experience particularly as the experience of another individual there is something dangerous about um that kind of um non-conformity to collective kind of um narratives which uh isn't always as kind of um uh doesn't have the kind of theatricality that like the likes of Novatore might kind of portray it as having um there there is something in again this is kind of uh, this is where um there's another unappreciated um influence on Camus there's something of a Kafkaesque quality to his like a metamorphosis of individual you know that individual individuality not as kind of something that is like you know the negativity of the cry of rebellion and the the black rose and all, all that sort of you know that sort of thing which is um is 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 kind of the uh the, the go-to image of you know european individualist anarchist right stuff um it's this kind of becoming animal kind of becoming not not becoming animal necessarily in terms of it as intensely as i've described becoming animal but that kind of thing of oh i'm a bug now and everyone looks at me weirdly which is, is kind of considered um in the outsider um or stranger um very intensely um in, in a way which is um which is very very uncomfortable like, have, have you ever read that work no i haven't i'm a little familiar with the with the theme of it but yeah the the the, the theme being that this this guy um does does something a bit shit for no apparent reason but and it, it, it again it's it's a way of like encountering this kind of never never being able to really appreciate the the reasoning of another individual because to us it's it's absurd reasoning why on earth um why ha, ha, has this individual done this i don't want to spoil too much so i'm going to avoid kind of giving too much of the narrative um because i do think it's it's a book that anyone kind of listening to this of an anarchist orientation who wants to really consider individualism individualist praxis in a way which is kind of a bit more sincere than the kind of the fetishized kind of glorified imagery which you can get in particularly classical um individual anarchist stuff there's something of a kind of oh this is deeply uncomfortable and and really um yeah a, a really kind of awkward at points um yeah uh okay so unfortunately i have uh you know my jobby job that's gonna <laughs> intrude on my life in about 12 minutes so Absolutely. let's um let's talk about the fall a little bit yeah well and uh you know maybe i could squeeze some more time in but yeah yep um so have, have you read the full no i haven't so, okay do you want me to just describe it and yeah it's, please it's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah yeah um the full is um in terms of I've not read all of his um, fiction, but in terms of his fiction that I have read, um, it is uh, probably the one I find most uncomfortable to read um, because the the person who you encounter, um, Jean-Baptiste Clements, um, uh, is evidently very dishonest throughout the um, throughout the text, and um, and there's something about just like um, finding dishonest individuals a bit uncomfortable, which I, I struggle with when reading it. But it's a really interesting, um, interestingly written uh, novella. It's um, one side of a series of conversations between this guy, Jean-Paptiste Clements, um, who is a, um, a judge penitent, um, and this other individual who we never hear of. He, his side of the conversation is, is not given. Um, and 
it's kind of the obvious thing is it's it's a kind of play on the fall of man from Eden in many ways and cons- and it considers questions of like innocence um and what it means to be innocent um and yeah and this is one of the things which uh, the 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 character does is he describes um himself as um he kind of he rids himself of his own sins through judging others and it's kind of a play on like christian type practices um but there's this with with this kind of there is, there is a definite kind of throughout the text a desiring kind of the primitive innocence as it's i think it's put in one point primitive innocence or what we could what i'd call like primordial innocence of kind of this thing of pre-moral being of kind of um of life before you've got morality and normative morality imposed upon existence um which for me is a very um civilized uh thing it's it's not something that i think is is real it's a reality imposed on on the world through civilization in my belief um which kind of goes back um because I, I think this is that's i think all, as much as in terms of describing the fall within 12 minutes that's, i think there's as much as I, I i'd want to do um but it goes it brings it back to something from the myth of sisyphus which i think is really one of the most applicable things to anarchist um praxis and environmentalist praxis even if you differentiate those which i don't personally but if for anyone listening, if you do differentiate those, it's relevant for both of them, which is this thing that Camus affirms in the myth of Sisyphus, um, which is um integrity has no need for rules. If you have if you if you have a if you have a sense of integrity about what you want in the world in, in your in your life, if you have integrity, then any rule that like that um is encouraging you to do something that you think is shit or that you don't want to do, or you just yeah anything like that or any rule telling you not to do something that you want to do that you believe is worth doing or beautiful or anything like these kind of that there there's there's nothing kind of to to get in the way really other than your own lack of integrity Um, and with that there is something about an appeal to pre-moral kind of primordially innocent kind of being with that which is kind of this integrity being something that is pre-moral that makes sense yeah absolutely i i know he deals with integrity uh, in the rebel as well yeah and from what i've read about the stranger the outsider uh this pre-moral idea is important there so there is something of of it there though I, i wouldn't say it's as strong as in the fall um for me the the uh the stranger the outsider is um which i always find interesting the outsider rather than being inside outside as an environmental thing the the, the one who is outside rather than inside in terms of like civilization pre-moral being and all that um there is just something within i i would not say that the um the main character in the outside uh, is an individual who i encounter as having much integrity so um i so i find them a kind of challenging character to kind of really um connect to um in that in that way but it, but it's um it's worth reading um but yeah there's something of um something there which i think that that kind of lack of um belief in in rules is just obviously applicable to to an anarchist um praxis whatever that praxis is if that's creating dangerously or not, or like, you know, organizing a narco syndicalist trade union. Like, you know, if that's it, <laughs> you shouldn't have any any rules saying, can't form a union. Like, if you want to do it, do it. <laughs> like, uh, so what are some of the other themes in the in the fall? Um there is a one of the um one of the themes is regarding freedom. Um, particularly uh, how um, a kind of Christian, Camus' portrayal of a Christian uh, world view or Christian politic um, would be kind of anti-freedom or not desiring freedom. Um, and there's an in- there's an interesting section where the um, where Jean Baptiste Clements he describes himself as when he was in a um, a prison camp. 
he was uh, kind of elected the position of Pope um, for the uh, prison camp. But, um, and this, this whole thing about kind of a religion, religious kind of ritual kind of forming within the context of a highly kind of totalitarian situation and kind of, and that kind of religious institution and set of rituals kind of further intensifying that kind of uh, repressive quality of of the space there's something there which is um which is interesting um I, there's when i first first kind of really um seriously read the fall um i was doing so while kind of really considering um the idea of being in the world and kind of the um and with that the idea of the closed that kind of the the kind of the idea of closing off from being in the world and not being in the world and i was always struck by um clemence's kind of how much i can't remember where it's set exactly it's somewhere in europe um it's um yeah I, I i forget um the the country where it's set in um which is not like the main focus but the the, the kind of the uh the kind of uh, repulsion that the character uh, feels for the space, which is very urbanized and um, and quite ruinated, but there's 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 a kind of there's a closed off from being in the world quality um, within within the text, which is again kind of you. It's kind of a um, a kind of old school primitivist kind of notion of like drawing from the fall of man. It's what Daniel Quinn does. Um, and his thing and it's um it's not an aspect of the kind of anti-civ critique which i am overly fond of but i can appreciate why it's there and kind of and there's something which i, I think to be drawn from um in this kind of thing of civilization yeah you know that kind of thing of that yeah narrative of always oh, separated ourselves from nature i and think there's an well yeah there's some of that as well especially with like the symbolic uh language kind of stuff yeah that's his fall yeah yeah there's there's something that i can't um can't remember who it was um one of the old like writes from um i think it's green anarchist um mia x mia x cursion I, I forget like one of the one of the kind of green anarchist primitivist writers there is a piece which i'm thinking of i can't remember the name of if I remember it, I'll send it to you to put in the show notes. Perfect. Yeah. Um, by the way, it looks like I do not have to go. So Ooh. pressure's <laughs> off. Uh, pressure's off. So yeah, any of that detail <laughs> you wanted to talk about, uh, feel free. Well, okay. Well then I think just bringing it back to kind of, uh, Camus, um, characters as being kind of examples of um like like the outsider in in the rebel this focus on one single character and their experience of being in the world like for me does gesture intensely towards this kind of real push to deal with our approach um the kind of the singular aloneness of experiencing being in the world and, and, and that kind of, you know, that thing, which is not this being with others. Cause in the text, you are not being with others. You are being with this one character almost pushed into the role of the other character who you are, which is the other side of the conversation. So like, um, cause there are points where like, um, Jean Baptiste responds to things in in the middle of his kind of monologues, which is like, okay, I didn't say that, but I've got to assume that the other character said that. That makes sense, um, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, there there is something of a real um, of really wanting to kind of push a reader into being being alone with this other person, 
which again is a really uncomfortable individualism. It's not that kind of really, um, it's not that dramatic relationship of kind of, oh, aren't you beautiful, Renzo Novatore, for all your kind of like flowery poetry, all that kind of just to do it for your side of the Atlantic, that kind of um, uh, individualism of, oh, aren't you an amazing capitalist? It's this thing of, oh, right. you are the rugged weak. individualism. Yeah, it's it's this kind of thing of, oh, I'm encountering something that is really weird, really uncomfortable, but is just true and real. And and then that being with this really uncomfortable thing, it's there's a there's a quality of kind of 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 revolt in there in in the fall in this thing of like for me I, I i read this book and i go oh you you revolt me you fucking judge penitent fuck you like judging judging me as as i read this like feeling like you're absolving your own shittiness through judging me like fuck you and there, there, there it, it, it kind of it triggers that re- revolt and that kind of that that desire to kind of go like no fuck you i'm gonna rebel like there's, there's, there's something of that kind of individualism in there if that makes sense sure yeah uh you know it's like you know we you see that a lot in the existentialist novels like nausea or I yeah. guess kafka well yeah right so makes sense uh he rejected that label but whatever oh i don't think it's a whatever I, I think there's a definite difference between what Camus puts forward and the existentialist put forward. In general. Sure. But I'm, I say whatever because when if you really want to be proper about who counts as an existentialist, you have like three people that would accept the label. Maybe. I mean, Sartre decided on that being a label. Heidegger rejected it. Uh, Camus yeah. rejected it. But I, I, it, for me, it's not about like accepting the label. Like, the, 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 I, I would say that in that, for, for the most part, every other existential, every other existentialist who I encounter, um, there is some level of um, appealing to transcend the absurd. Like, yeah, Camus, that's true. Yeah. Camus, doesn't do that and i and, I, and this is one of the reasons I, I don't consider kafka an absurdist uh, an existentialist i consider him an absurdist um in that like like shestov camus kafka they all kind of are doing the being with the absurd whereas like sartre it's about transcending the meaninglessness to find meaning or creating meaning like same with simone de beauvoir um, to some degree, same with Heidegger, like same with others. Heidegger for sure. De Beauvoir, I mean, the ethics of ambiguity, you're kind of getting more to that, being comfortable with the absurd, but which would be yeah. the ambiguity. But, but but there's still that kind of Sartre and gesture towards the kind of the overcoming of. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and obviously Sartre is this a huge moralist too. So. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. Though so, Yeah, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so Camus became uh a big seller again during the COVID lockdowns because of his book The Plague. Have you read that one? Yes, I tried to reread it during um during our plague and um and I didn't read all of it, but I read bits of it for my um uh when preparing um the paper i did at the anarchist studies network conference in 2020 um and he, uh okay humans what's the fucking point um the eco absurdism essay um and um yeah it's a again it, it's it's a longer it's a longer book and, and i kind of was just like uh, do I want to re- reread all of this? I'll just I'll just flick through and find the bits that that. Yeah, I need- and I I got it on audio, and uh, I was trying to you know listen to a little bit before I fell asleep, and then it just the whole you know he starts talking about rats, and I'm just like, okay, I'm, I don't think I'm going to get through this. Not that I hate rats, but just uh, I don't know. Didn't catch me. Didn't keep my. Didn't attention. catch you. Rats don't catch you. 
No. Wow. That, that's an interesting point of like, no, nah, there's rats. Not gonna, not gonna go with that. Uh, I, you know, it's a, I guess, sort of a the reason why. So, do you know who Ambrose Bierce is? He was uh, one of the right. first horror writers. He um, wrote quite. He has a really good story about rats, and then you know Lovecraft, and I just I feel like the theme of rats <laughs> is. <laughs> A little uh, played out for me, I guess. But <laughs> you've done rats too much. <laughs> done with their fucking yeah. Lovecraft and this other dude. Like it's fucked up rats for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rats um, again. <laughs> how are you when you like if if you're just somewhere and like the Rat Pack starts playing? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> Boomtown Rats as well. <laughs> yeah. Those are the yeah. only two bands I can remember with rats in the name. I had a rat. You had a rat? I had a rat named Pepper, but yeah. Oh. Anyway. Okay. They don't um, last that long. <laughs> they don't live that long. Right. <laughs> last. Like it's cheese in your fridge. Didn't last that long. <laughs> uh, um, no, I, I think... I think the... Um, I think the plague is more relevant to an environmentalist conversation than it is to an anarchist conversation. Um, personally, um, let me just find the um, the quotes that I got. Um, for the, uh, for the essay. Okay. Um, Cause it's, yeah, it's, Again, this is something where I, I do think there is a very um, there's something relevant in Camus' philosophy to an environmental conversation, which is not yet very present. So here's the quote. Um, um, this is from the perspective of a doctor who is dealing with a uh, plague, trying to support people um, through plague. So um, I have no idea what's awaiting me or what will happen when this all ends. For the moment, I know this. There are sick, there are sick people, and they need curing, um, which is a... When transferring that or translating that into an environmental conversation, you go, like, for me, it's like, I have no idea where things are going to go or what's coming. Anything like, I have some beliefs, but I have no, no idea. But... For me, it's important to say that that there is something of a kind of a dyingness in the world, or kind of or or sickness in the in the world. Um, for me, I, I describe um, civilization as being like a, a cancer, somewhat similar to Edward Abbey's description. Um, and and with that, there's something of healing and recovery. I, I, the word curing is a bit strong for me um but like there's something about um a desire for healing and recovery and those sorts of even if eventually in that kind of eco absurdism thing fucking eventually the sun will explode and fucking take all of this out and you know and every single tree that is alive today will fucking die at some point knowing all that i i still go like I don't know what's at the end of it. I still just want to fucking care for this sh shit. And, and it's not, that's not a position that's comfortable in environmentalist conversations. If you do the thing of it's all absurd doing that kind of ecological care thing, because they're all, we're all being towards death, even this whole fucking planet, like right. it's going to happen at some point. We could say, right. why not now? Like, you know, that's that that sort of line for the most part will get you a lot of kind of uh, fuck you but for me it's a real and true thing to to say and there's something important about you know why why do it and for me that the response is kind of because i want to because i feel this kind of rebellious compulsion that i it's my egoistic desire to do so um and um and i and i and there's something of a, you know, 
a care thing. So the doctor in that context has a has a will to care, has their will to power, their will to life. And and for them that's trying to cure um the individuals infected with plague. Um which uh yeah is just um is not a a comfortable way of approaching environmentalist discourse or the idea of doing medical discourse like everyone's being towards death um anyway so why not just let them die now yeah i mean it's sort of a cosmic perspective or you know a view from nowhere yeah. sort of look at things too because i mean it's first of all it's you know you need to be able to get outside of the first person perspective to even entertain this idea of uh um an end to nature i mean that's based on predictions that we 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 derive from science right in in the kind of our stereotype of the general norm yes but is it does it require a uh, an outside of first person perspective can i not see that everything that i encounter that's living kind of has a birth and a death and then kind of go well all of these beings everything that i experience in my direct lived experience is born and dies and everything that i i experience is born and then dies why would that not apply to you know i don't know if it is limited to the to an outside of first person perspective i think the idea of like a total death is cuz when you from the first person perspective if you you're seeing this recurrence or if you're nietzsche uh uh whatever he calls it uh, eternal, eternal return yeah eternal yeah. recurrence or you know reincarnation you see this birth and life birth and death process happening over and over again you don't see like a total end to everything uh i don't think the destruction of, of earth implies the end of everything it just implies the end because all the stuff that is earth will go out into the universe and then somewhat become something else that's in, true in, you know if we're doing it on that kind of outside of first person perspective even that are we going to talk about the the ancient aliens hypothesis? <laughs> that wasn't where I was going. If you want to talk that, we can talk that. I'm not I'm not something I know much about. <laughs> but like you know, it it will it will all go out into the universe somehow, into the the, the void somehow, become something else. <laughs> all right, fair enough. <laughs> you can extrapolate from the first person perspective. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, I think that the, um, there's obviously, there, there's obviously, there is a quality of cosmic pessimism in, in that kind of gesture towards a really kind of absurdist environmentalism, which I'm, which I, is that there is definitely something of that there, but I, 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 I feel like the groundedness of kind of lived experience has that quality as well. Um, and um, in that in my lived experience I've never been able to see anything transcend pain, suffering, death all those processes um, in a way which is just like yeah it's absurd to keep on going but we still keep on doing it Um and I think that that can be that experience of, you know, of real earthy absurdity, like is 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 very um, can be very direct and immediate. While it can also be done from a very, um, you know, from a god's eye perspective as well. Are you familiar at much with Buddhism? I I, I am an ex Buddhist. Um, uh, uh, I um I was involved in um a kind of somewhat split between a couple 
um, variants of Buddhism um, practice, uh, particularly in my very latter teens going into my first year of my 20s. And then I quit my Buddhist practice um, following um, the ending of my cancer treatment. Um, and it was really my cancer treatment that killed my um, ability to embrace um, embrace Buddhist dogma. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't, you know, I'm not especially uh, uh, well-read in Buddhism, but from what I have read, it does, when I think about Camus and I think about some of the things he talks about, it reminds me of what I've read about buddhism um okay. i don't yeah i don't i was just curious if you picked up on any of that in what way does in what way does he remind you kind well of there's something about this i this notion of absurdity that seems to that just it, re, it reminds me of meditation like mindfulness and just not uh allowing like meanings to slip away and not 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 hold on to them and be attached to them um so for my for, for my interpretation of uh Buddhist teachings that I've encountered um, and from and in terms of my reasoning for stopping that practice and kind of almost becoming somewhat um, almost approaching a kind of anti-Buddhist kind of position um, which is very informed by a kind of Nietzschean Camusian type uh, differentiation um the reason why i um moved away from buddhism uh largely in a kind of reductive quick reason this is not the whole thing um but i began to find um buddhist uh philosophy is very life renouncing in terms of like non-attachment um which i think is why a lot of the kind of more ascetic um kind of more extreme buddhist stuff kind of ends up with practitioners dying um and um and those you know there's there's a thing of i remember reading about um they kind of almost self-mummify on this one mountain go into a cave and like wrap them, themselves in and if 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 the mummification is successful they you know you know that they they reached enlightenment and escaped the cycle of um but rebirth and death like and all these things where it was just um yeah in a way where and the kind of the uh trying to transcend pain um non-attach from pain and those things um through avoiding like pleasure and wonderful experiences um i found rather um I found it extremely revolting and I could not go with it. I was trying to do it nicer than that, but yeah, I found it extremely revolting. And I ended up, um, I ended up approaching a very, um, with that mindset, approaching a very suicidal point in my, in my life. Um, really, really feeling like what was, the, why would I, why did I do that? Um, why did I survive cancer? Why not just die? Cause I'm just going to feel suffering and pain no matter what. So if, if that stuff's bad, like why not just fucking die? And try and transcend it um and i ended up uh rereading if it's Sisyphus and rereading um thus spoke zarathustra um uh kind of in the months kind of kind of in, in the, like over a two-month period kind of following the end of that train of thought and kind of was really moved and inspired by the kind of the yes saying to life that i found in both of those um and that's the kind of that's the thing that really kind of got me, um, there was like a pathway into the stuff which end, ended in, up into kind of feral consciousness and all of that stuff. And, and me like, um, really considering, um, like, uh, 
Heidegger's philosophy of technology and then further technology critiques and all that, um, that kind of moving away from Buddhist thought and Buddhist type thought was, yeah, a big part of my personal exploration of philosophy and, and stuff and my life narrative. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I cannot say that I, I, I feel similarly on that because for me, I encounter it as kind of in that I encounter Buddhism as a very life renouncing um, philosophy um, in many ways. I'm not saying that's all Buddhists are life renouncing there. I'm just saying that sure. in terms of, in terms of the scripture and the philosophy and whatnot, sure. um, that's, that's my experience of it. Um, I, yeah, I, I find myself much more attracted to the, um, to the French guy who, wrote some stuff <laughs> rather than the, the, the rather than the the deep wisdom of, of the buddha probably probably why i never got too far into buddhism myself um <laughs> for similar reasons uh have you ever i know we're talking about camu but kafka wrote this story called the hunger artist have you ever read that i one? love the hunger artist that's I very love, yeah i love kafka that's i think an kafka amazing so underappreciated and and yeah i i i do see not just in, in Buddhism, but in lots of spiritually woke like individuals, like yeah, just so many hunger artists. Like, do you want to describe the hunger artist? Because I feel like you were so ready to do that. Oh, I mean, it's been a long time since I've I've read it, but I just you know, it's a it's a story about uh you know these people who are called hunger artists or starvation artists. And they would perform their own starvation in front of a crowd in like cir sideshows, circuses or whatever. And I forget what the point, <laughs> the whole point of it was, but it, it just described, I just remember the descriptions being very powerful for me. It ends up with this, there's one particular hunger artist, which the story is focused on it. It ends up, um, someone he's dying. This individual is dying and they try and someone tries to, um, him to eat and the conclusion is he, he says that i'm not actually doing anything out of kind of this this great sacrifice it's just that i've not found any food i like and you just right. go that it's just it's just it's it's not this like fucking beautiful or incredible thing it's just that really you know it's like some you know their parents didn't get them to eat their peas. They're just like, no, I don't like it. Like, yeah. <laughs> you need to eat something, or you're gonna die. And you know, like, and but there's, but there is this thing of like, you know, the ascetic who does not eat to, you know, overcome their suffering and, and reach enlightenment. Eh, just a hunger artist. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. Ein Hunger Künstler is the German. Okay. Um, so, all right. So returning to Camus and just, I guess, to tie things off, some of the spicier controversial things about Camus, uh, from an anarchist perspective is, you know, he's got a, has some sort of, uh, there's something about him where someone asked him if he should join the war, join the resistance or, um, or save his mother. and. Uh, I think he, well, his conclusion was something like he would rather save his mother, even though he wouldn't be able to resist the Nazis or something like that. But this applies also sort of, he's got this uh, take on the Algerian resistance where he supported the resistance, um, but the his reasoning behind it was he was against violence. and. He, so he's sort of, his take is sort of interpreted as being a little bit cowardly. And I was wondering if you had thoughts on this sort of, well, this is especially like Sartre's critique of him is that he's a coward. Um, well, in terms of uh, the first one, the, do I join the resistance or do I save my mother? And I, and I know I'm saying this as someone who lost their mother when they were seven and like still fucking misses their mother and wants wishes for a mother. Um, 
I'd save the, I'd save my mum like, rather than joining some cause. I'd fucking save save what like protect someone I have a embodied lived relationship of being with rather than join some fucking cause elastic organization. Like not to disav not to not appreciate what the resistance did, but yeah, sure, I'd 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 go for, for my mother and and I'd I'd hope any individual of integrity would like show love to those that they know, those who they are in relationship with rather than like joining the cause. Um it's my my feeling. Um and in terms of like the the, the, the the cowardice thing, like okay, if he was a coward, he was he was a coward in that moment. We all have moments of being scared. Like and like fucking in terms of like this 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 guy maybe maybe cowardly in that sense did some fucking brave things as well like advocating some stuff publicly putting himself out there like that's fucking brave like i i i feel that he, he did some brave stuff as well and there's lots of i can appreciate um i, I fucking when i first heard of what the rajavans were doing in terms of like resisting isis i thought that's some fucking great shit there that's some fucking brave shit all right I'm not fucking going out there to join you, all right. I'm not. I didn't join them. Right. I didn't join them. All right. First thing, because um, it's not my fight. It's not where I am. I, I'd be doing it as some kind of causiastic thing. It's not in my immediate lived experience. It's it's you know, and I'd be doing it because of a spectacle. But also, I didn't do it because I didn't want to do it. I didn't like. I didn't want to go there and like do the militarist thing. It's not not what I wanted to do. Like, I could be called a coward for, for that. As much as I really fucking respected what they did in terms of like fucking up ISIS shit and whatnot, like it's just not something I did. Um, I've also um, I've not gone to like to America and joined the people. Um, which forest is it? The trying to stop police city. Um, um, uh i mean i know there's been a few i think, it's the, atlanta the... Forest. I think it's the atlanta forest um i forget but there there is a there's a there's a uh there's a really there was a really uh, i don't know if it's still going i hope it's is still they are still resisting the kind of the deforestation to build um cop city i think is what they were calling it um but like these kind of eco rebels whatever you want to call them like green anarchists whatever like i thought what they were doing was fucking incredible and beautiful i'm not going all the way to america to, to deal with that and there's stuff here that i'm not i'm not doing like you know i'm not involved in um because i'm doing other things yeah sure i think yeah. that's a really good comparison actually uh yeah. the way i feel about sartre's whole critique is he was being a staunch dogmatic communist and he had sour grapes about Camus uh, criticizing Marx. And I mean, for whatever Sartre says about Camus uh, and breaking with him over his response to uh, the modern times critique of the rebel, like Sartre was taking the wrong position. I th from, I think even from his own, uh his own philosophy so i agree i was somewhat not engaging with the sart thing i was thinking about anarchist responses um but yeah oh yeah yeah um yes there is that side of it <laughs> so i don't know what else is spicy about camu uh he was um a good looking gentleman died in a car crash have you ever heard the uh theory that um that car crash might have been orchestrated by uh the government i've no, i'd never heard of that but i i the appeal to conspiracy i just <laughs> it's I, out I just, there I, I i just find all right maybe i don't know i don't know I don't it's know. out there yeah it, it's out there i i find conspiracy theory generally um tends towards empowering the image of um state stuff it just it, it for me it, it's 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 supportive of psychic 
um, authoritarianism, and I just kind of go like, no, I don't really want to. I, I don't pay much into that. So I, I, I'm a bit. I, I feel like if they did, all right, they didn't. They didn't stop his thought getting out there. Absolutely not. No. Yeah. It's kind of a whatever thing. <laughs> no way of knowing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so we did Camus. Uh, not we really. Did Camus. Yeah, I, there's plenty more to say about him, but I think, you know, if anyone has not engaged with him seriously, this is a pretty good introduction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Why did he do that? What was his reason? Ah, oh. He was so absurd. <laughs> Fucking absurd cosmic unreasonableness there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm now indifferent to the, you know, to, to your want for me to stop it. I have become the absurd. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, I'm sure we'll be having you on again for something or other. We always seem to find a reason. So, uh, oh, oh, no. We fucked up our conversation. Now we're back to reason. We have reasons. Oh, it's shit. Absurd. <laughs> we affirmed. We're affirming. <laughs> All right. All right. I'll talk to you later. Say goodbye to the audience. Toodaloo. Toodaloo.